let's welcome V to the stage. What an honor to stand here tonight and wrap up this day of celebrating women in mission. I mean, hey, this doesn't happen very often that there's an organization that's willing to say, we're going to commit a whole day to celebrating the women in our midst. And so I just want to shout out to Roy and Sharon and all the national leaders. This is amazing. This is really a special thing. And I feel very honored to stand here and wrap it up. You know, we've been sitting in the book of Acts the last few days, and Nick left us this morning right at the point where God pours out the Spirit at, on the day of Pentecost, and um, it was pretty cool to think about that happening, about, you know, the crazy stuff with tongues of fire and the wind. Some pretty amazing stuff happened, and as... Um, this kind of commotion was going on. They somehow moved to the temple, as Nick was saying, because thousands of people gathered. And Peter stood up and he brought, he spoke to the people and he spoke out of the book of Joel. And that's where I want to land tonight with you guys um, as we wrap up this amazing day. In the book of Joel, so if you have your old paper Bibles, open them up. Does anyone, any of you ladies or any of you men out there want to read for me? I think we have a microphone somewhere. Well, yeah, I'm going to need this later. Chad's got his Bible. Chad, would you read Joel for me? On my phone? Yeah, or you can use mine. Mine's very tiny. I'll read yours. Okay, so Joel's gonna read, um, Chad's going to read Joel for us. Chapter 2, we're going from verse 28 through to 32. To 32. Mm -hmm. okay. To the end. The day of the Lord, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and bills, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Thank you. Let me pray. Well, Lord, we just, we come tonight to sit at your feet and to just spend some time in your word, Lord. And we ask that um, your spirit would be present, as we know it is. Lord, we ask that you would just shine your light on our hearts through your word, we pray that um, you'd be speaking to us. We pray that uh, your wisdom would flow through this room. We pray that you'd be glorified by uh, what we talk about tonight. We just commit all these things into your hands, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wanted to start by telling you the story of a leader of a nation, someone who sat as a judge someone who was filled with the Holy Spirit, and this woman's name was Deborah, and you'll find her story in the book of Judges in chapter 4, and she was a really interesting lady. She um, is recorded as being um, the only woman who led Israel during this time before the Israelites got the king that they wanted when Samuel finally anointed Saul, but she's a leader of her people. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. She's a prophet, and back in those days before the day of Pentecost, not everyone was filled with the Spirit. Just a few people got anointed with the Spirit of God. They were set aside for a certain purpose, and Deborah was one of those people. So she led her people. She heard from God. And one day, God speaks to her, and he says, it's, it's time. It's time to fight the Canaanites who have been oppressing you for 20 years. They've been cruelly oppressed by King Jabin. It's time. Call the leader of your army. Call him in. We're going we're gonna to go into battle, and we're going to get free. So she calls in Barak, who's the commander of the Israelite army, and she, she lays out the plan for him. We're going we're gonna to gather our forces, and we're going to go down, and we're going to get free from Canaan. And he is a little hesitant. He says to her, okay, I'll go, but only if you go with me. If you don't go, I'm not going. And I kind of feel sorry for Barak, because, you know, he didn't have the Spirit of God in him. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. He just knew that she did, and she, he wanted her with him. And so she says to him, well, okay, yes, I will go with you into battle, but because you are hesitating, the, the victory here will not be given to you. 
the honour of killing the commander of the enemy will actually go to a woman. So Deborah, she, ride, well, she walks into battle with her people because, you know, the Israelites didn't ride horses. I was investigating this, but it was so fascinating. They, didn't, they went into battle on foot. And, you know, Barak was pretty hesitant because the Canaanites had like 900 iron chariots. They had horses. They were a well-equipped army. And I guess he knew that it was pretty likely they were going to get thumped. So they ride or they walk to face the enemy. And it happens, as the Lord had said to Deborah, they kill every last soldier of their enemy army except for the commander, Sisera. And he flees on, on foot. He gets out of his chariot and basically runs away. And he goes to the tent of a guy called Heba, the Kenite. Now, for, you, for American, Australians, it's Heba. For Americans, it's Heber. <laughs> and Heber, he was an ally of King Jabin. So obviously, Sisera is going to find refuge, to find um, safety as his army's been completely destroyed. So he, he goes to this tent, and there is the wife of Heber. Her name is Jael, and she's obviously been left behind because her husband's gone off to war. And she doesn't hide in the tent. She doesn't pretend she's not home. But he comes to her and she says, come, come into my tent. And in that culture, the only men who were allowed into a woman's tent were, it was her father or her husband. So it probably seemed like a really good place to go and hide. So she, she brings him into her tent. He asks for water, but she gives him a glass of milk. She lays him down in a nice soft bed. And then she takes what she has in her home, a tent peg and a hammer, and she drives the tent peg through his temple and kills him. So, I mean, I'm sure that her bedding was never the same. It'd be hard to get that much blood and brains out of. But I just love this. I love this little snapshot of these two women who serve God in such different ways. They both show up for God. Deborah shows up as a leader of her nation, as a judge, as someone who goes into battle. That was very rare in um, Israel. Women did not go into battle. On the one hand, you've got this leader of a nation. And then on the other hand, you've got a woman who probably wasn't even an Israelite, but she showed up for God with what she had. She didn't have a sword. She didn't have an axe. She just had a tent peg and a hammer. And she won this great victory for God. So I just wanted to start with that because I think it shows this breadth of what women can do when we choose to show up for God and when we use what we have. So I love um, thinking through um, all the ways that women show up in the Bible because we all know that human beings love to concentrate power in the hands of a few. You know, and, and in the Jewish nation, it was the Jewish men who had most of the power. The women didn't get to operate in political spheres or economic spheres. They didn't often get to inherit any property. They were kind of, they operated around the edges of leadership. But still, we see them show up in the Bible. I don't have time to talk tonight about Esther or Tamar or Abigail or Ruth or, I mean, there's so many women whose names we know, and it's really remarkable because they existed at a time when women, they, they existed largely in the home, and they were defined by their relationship to the men around them, which I think is kind of cool because women love men, and we love relationships, but that was where they mostly operated in that sphere. And so when we come to this text in Joel, we see that God's just kind of throwing a spanner in the works. You know, the Jewish people have operated culturally in this way where the men are the stakeholders, the Jewish men, and then suddenly he just throws a bombshell out there. And I often, I love to think of Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, where God says to us, to, to the, the people that he's created, for your thoughts are not my thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I think sometimes we, we come to a text like this and we read it and we forget that in that cultural context, this was radical, revolutionary. You know, back um, 
in those days, not even everyone could operate in the religious rituals. You know, it was just the, the Levites, the Levite men who could serve in the temple. And here God is saying, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. So it's not just the Jewish men anymore. It's not even just the Jewish men and women. It's everyone. It transcends ethnic boundaries. It transcends gender. This, this is radical stuff. And he kind of leaves us no wiggle room. You know, he talks about old men. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. You're not ever going to be too old or too young. Sorry, I'm not used to having glasses. I got old somewhere in the last five years. Can't read my Bible anymore. So you're never going to be too old. You're never going to be too young in God's kingdom to be empowered with the Spirit. Suddenly, God just says, I'm going to democratize power in the kingdom of God. It's no longer going to be concentrated in the hands of a few. It's for everyone. And yeah, he's, he's even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So the only restriction placed on it is that you have to be a servant of the Lord to receive this power. Other than that, it's totally inclusive. It's everyone. And that I mean, we know that's not the way that the world we live in operates. I don't know if you guys can think of any sphere in your life, really, where power is shared equally amongst everyone. And then it gets a little more interesting as we go on. He's, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. You know, that sounds kind of scary, you know, like Armageddon, blood and fire, and billows of smoke. But I think if we remember to look at this through the cross, you know, we're on the other side of the cross, and if we think about the blood, we're actually, through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, we're actually brought into God's presence. But for that, blood is kind of a terrifying thing, but if we think about it as being that is our entryway into God's presence. And the smoke and the fire, if we think back to Egypt when they were brought out of, sorry, Israel, when they were brought out of Egypt, God led them by day with a pillar of smoke and by night with a pillar of fire. So again, he's like taking these powerful images of his presence and saying, this is what's going to happen when I pour out my spirit on everyone. You all will have access to my presence and that's what will give you the power to do my will. It's so cool. And then... Um, we go on, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It's really amazing to think about something being great and dreadful all at the same time. I think of many times I've been surfing and the ocean has seemed both great and dreadful to me, terrifying and fun at the same time. And it really depends on where you're standing in relation to the cross as to whether this day of the Lord is going to be great or dreadful. I mean, for the, the people witnessing God pouring out the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, it was probably a pretty scary and frightening time. But if they knew Jesus, if they were a servant of him, and they received that, it's a totally different perspective. And I think often when we talk about the Spirit, we can find ourselves on either side of that. It can seem great and exciting and empowering, or it can seem kind of dreadful and scary and uncontrollable. And then finally, um, in this passage in Joel, he talks about everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Joel, was, Joel wrote these words um, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. He was born in 585 B.C., so we're talking a good long stretch of time between the penning of these words and their fulfillment. And the, the sentiment of these words, we can kind of look back through Scripture and see that it's not like God's suddenly done a U-turn and changed direction. We can think back to Genesis 1, verse 27, where God said, I have made them in my image, male and female, I have made them. And I think here God is referencing back to this beautiful completeness between men and women, male and female, together we're made in his image. And the, um, the beautiful inclusiveness of the spirit being poured out is a celebration of that. 
that the Old Testament is full of these stories of women showing up, showing up with um, whatever they had, whatever they had to use. And I just wanted to give... We had an awesome session this afternoon with the ladies. There was a lot of time where we were chatting, where we were sharing... Um, what it's like to be in ministry as a woman, and it was pretty cool. And so I wanted, I'd already invited my friend Hannah to come up and share a little bit of what um, her experiences have been choosing to show up for God. And so I'm just going to ask Hannah to come up now. What did I do with the microphone? Oh. So Hannah is a local girl. She grew up in Encinitas, and she mm. is now in the, Carl's, in the Cardiff CS chapter. And she's done lots of cool stuff. So, Hannah, can you tell us a little bit about what you've experienced when you've chosen to show up for God? Um, yeah. Awesome. Hello, my name's Hannah. Nice to see you guys all staring at me. It's great. Um, so, V asked me these questions earlier. And um, what has it been to, like... To show up for God. So, when he calls you into those spaces that seem... Um, scary or like you're not sure you belong there or just just like showing up like when you first started yeah that first camp you led with walking on water yeah I feel like it's been a ongoing process of saying yes and being stretched like a rubber band um, I think there's been times where I felt like a rubber band that's like getting pulled like this and I'm like I'm gonna snap and it's just like a continuous pulling and um, it's always been like the small things though like, saying yes to, like, each little step that gets put in front of me and being like, okay. And then going forward and be like, every step leads to something else that's, like, so special. And it's a crazy journey. Like, I think that's the coolest thing about being Christian is, like, life isn't boring at all. <laughs> like, we get to, use, like, live these crazy lives that are, like, so packed full of adventure if we say yes. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me it's been, like, feeling that stretch of obedience and... Um, having to lean on God, feeling mm -hmm. that stretch and not feeling like I could do it on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Hannah started when, how old were you when you started leading on um, the camps with walking on water? <laughs> yeah, I started walking water. <laughs> and um, I started going there when I was like in junior high. And then they let me go to the high school camp because it was at Trestles. And I was just like, can I stay? And they're like, sure. And so I just ended up going to like two weeks at Trestles camping out. And um, and then I just started showing up. <laughs> I didn't pay for the camps. So I was like, <laughs> when I was 17 and I could drive by myself, I would just show up. And they, didn't, they like, didn't know what to do with me. They're like, oh, you'll just be a helper. <laughs> so I, like, they had a position for it later on. I don't know what they called them. So you pioneered, you pioneered that role by yeah. showing up. <laughs> Chad did it too. Nina, Nina filled that role later. But, yeah, just started showing up and... <laughs> I think being there, like, whenever you show up, usually people will give you a job if you just ask. And so that's kind of, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of how it started, was just showing up and kind of being mentored by one of the older ladies that was running the camp. She just let me, like, buy food with her and sit in the car while she did things. And, yeah, it just led to them, like, making me a counselor when I was 19, <laughs> like, counseling girls that were, like, 18, and be like, I don't think I should be here. Um... <laughs> But it was, it's crazy because I think the biggest thing that has come from, like, those experiences is all relationships. Mm -hmm. Like, they're all, like, experiences of being, like, oh, I'm just going to be here and see how they use me. But the relationships, like, with Nina and with, like, the girls, and it's grown. And, like, seeing them, like, step up has been the most powerful thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sure they've been able to step up because they've seen you ahead of them along the way. Mm -hmm. So... My next question for you is, what are some of the things that have stopped you from showing up or have discouraged you from entering in mm. to those spaces? Um, I think the two things for me is whenever I felt, like, unwanted or un unneeded. Um, and those are, I think, two things that maybe everyone feels at certain parts of their life. Um, unwanted, if, like, you're just like, well, I don't think really they really care if I'm there or I don't think they really want me. Or unneeded when, like, oh, I don't really think, I think they can do it without me. Like, I don't think I need to be there. And um, I think the thing with unwanted, it's like, you're always wanted by God, and it doesn't really matter if people want you. I mean, that's kind of like the people-pleasing thing. And then 
unneeded, it's like, yeah, we're actually not needed. Like, in the sense, like, God can do it without us. Mm -hmm. Like, he's going to, like, the book of Esther. Like, I love Mm -hmm. that. Because, like, if she didn't step up, somebody else would have. And she would have missed out. Um, And so that feeling of being unwanted or unneeded, it's like, yeah, you're not really needed. But God wants you. Like, and he wants you to participate in what he's doing. Um, So I think those are two things that, like, I felt through my life in ministry. And I still feel them sometimes. And it's, like, kind of combating those lies of, like, all right. Mm -hmm. Like, what does God say? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, So thanks, Anna. I called this talk Showing Up because really in pouring out the Holy Spirit, that was God showing up for us in a, in a new way. And also, I think as we read these stories of, of women in the Bible, we see them just showing up time after time. We see that when Jesus was walking the earth, the women were there. They were supporting him. They were trailing along. They just kept showing up. They were there when he was crucified. They were there when he rose from the dead. Like, they were literally sitting outside his tomb waiting to see what was going to happen. I mean, they wanted to somehow minister to his body, but something amazing happened because they got up early and they went somewhere. They showed up, and I honestly, it sounds so simple and kind of uncomplicated, but I really think that it's foundational to walking with the Lord, that if you choose to show up somewhere, something happens. You make yourself available for God to work through you. And I do think that often we um, get discouraged from showing up because we feel there's no space for us because um, sometimes as women we can feel like we are only there to maybe um, make the food or, um, you know, we all have done a lot of that and it's a really important part of ministry but I think that we can easily get discouraged and just choosing to show up every week to your local chapter, just choosing to go to the camp even when you might have other things to do. God works when we show up. And as we like read on after Jesus died into the book of Acts, and look, I just want to talk about two women from the book of Acts. Um, The first is a Mary. We have lots of Marys. This is not Mary, Jesus' mom. This is not Mary Magdalene. This is not Mary, the sister of Lazarus. In fact, I don't think she's in the book of Acts. This is Mary, who is a widow. She's a wealthy widow. She lives in Jerusalem. She has a house that she is in charge of. She runs a large household, and she is friends with the disciples. In fact, she's a believer. And she just takes what she has, and she puts it at the disposals of the disciples. So her house is the house that they they go to to meet. And it's really cool because the disciples are there. She's friends with Peter. As, as everyone's basically doing church in this house that belongs to this Mary, Um, Her son, John Mark, becomes friends with Peter, and he actually ends up becoming Peter's assistant and writing the book of Mark. John Mark, he takes Peter's memoirs and writes them down. So I kind of like that link, that there's this woman who just takes what she has and offers it for the service of God's people, and her son ends up writing one of the biographies of Jesus. It's really cool. And there's some other really interesting women, but I'm just going to park on Priscilla who is the wife of Aquila. And she shows up in Acts chapter 18. And she has kind of an interesting life. She's a businesswoman. She works with her husband making tents like Paul. And Paul is a friend of theirs. And so they invite him to stay with her. The most simple of things. He moves in and lives with them for 18 months. And during that time, obviously, they see him minister. They work with him. They... um, Their heads probably grow a lot in terms of their theological knowledge. And then they go with him to Ephesus. And while they're in Ephesus, they meet this guy called Apollos. And he apparently is a really clever, well-educated, articulate man. But he doesn't know the full story. He only knows about Jesus up to John the Baptist. And so Priscilla and Aquila take him and they teach him the whole gospel. And he obviously goes on to minister, and he actually is one of two people that they think may have written the book of Hebrews, because it was either him or Barnabas, scholars think. And again, I just think it's so cool that this woman, she takes what she has, which is her home, and she just offers it for God's service. So simple. We all, pretty much most of us have a home. We have something we can use. But what's really interesting about Priscilla and 
Aquila is that, I don't even know how to say his name. Is it Aquila? Anyway, Priscilla and Aquila, their names rhyme. That's kind of cool. When it starts out, talking about them in Acts, it starts with Aquila and Priscilla. His name comes first. And then as their story kind of develops, her name is actually first. It turns into Priscilla and Aquila. And scholars think that's because her ministry maybe just was more, she was more involved in what the church was doing. But that is just, again, a little clue that as women, we have to go and we have to like hoover up these clues to find, um, I guess, a sense that women are able to minister for the Lord in in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, in the beautiful fullness of that outpouring at Pentecost. So as women show up and as they use what they have, what is in their hand to serve God, cool stuff happens. And I want to ask up my friend Signe, and she's going to talk to us a little bit, bit about what she has seen happen in her life and the life of her family as she's used what she has. So Signe, Pastinetta. Lives in Carlsbad, goes to the CS Carlsbad Mission, um, mother of six, mm-hmm. <laughs> amazing lady. Anyway, so Sig, you, I've just seen you over the years, you use what you have, mm-hmm. have to stand down here, use what you have to serve the Lord, and so can you give us a little bit of a sense of, of what that's looked like for you? First of all, super honored to be asked to speak up here in front of all of you guys, and I see so many like faces that are family, and I think it started when our boys were Carson and Diego, um, maybe entering their teen years, and um, I, there was for the first time a space in my life with six young children starting to like not need me every second of the day, and I was like, okay, wow, what does this look like, God? I know that you call everybody into ministry. Even outside my home, I started to feel like, God, I want a ministry larger than just, not just my family, but outside of my family. But I had tried to step outside beyond my family, and it just took too much away from my family, and I got called back pretty quickly. It just didn't work. I said, God, I need something that I can still do, that I'm with my family, but it's serving where they are. And and how do I do this, God? Because I feel like there's more. There's something more going on. And... um, Thankfully, God did not say use the hammer and the tent peg because <laughs> that would have been, that would not would not have gone well. But I, I and and sometimes I went, but God, what do I have? What ta- what talents do I have? And sometimes we're so close to what we have that we don't see what we can offer. And I, got, I knew it was like, okay, I know it's time, I know it's talents, and I know it's the treasures, the resources. But God, what do I have? And I'm like, I don't know. But I kept going to, like, the CS gatherings after the, like, after the, you know, getting out of the water. And, like, we had pizza, like, Costco pizza for literally, I don't know, every single night <laughs> for a few years or something. And, and, um, and I just heard, like, this constant repeat of, like, oh, the, yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah, but I'm starving. But, yeah, like, Costco pizza, I'm so over it. And if anyone's been in church life for, like, any number of years, like, you've had your fill of pizza. So I said, well, I could probably just provide a meal. Like, that might just give a bit of a reprieve from, like, pizza night. And so I did that. And then that just started to blossom one thing into the next. And um, I saw that food as, and I saw God equipping me in this way, like, feeding a large family multiple times throughout the day, that um, I was able to provide this space for people to come and gather Um, And it just brought people together, but then it just allowed more space to sit and talk and develop those relationships and those friendships. And so then that went on for a while. We did that. um, And then COVID hit, and um, the boys were out surfing, and they would, church kind of got mixed up in the midst of all that. Like, And so they were out surfing Sunday mornings, and they would come back with their friends, um, some who are believers and some who are not, and they'd be hungry. And they're like, hey, can you just cook us up some food or can we cook food? And so it kind of organically, just as CS I feel is, organically began to create this space for people to come. And I was like, oh, this is the unchurched on Sunday mornings. And so for me, it's been this place of trying to provide a bridge between um, the church and surfers, and just a space to get to know God, but primarily around food, which 
seems so simple, but it just, I think it brings people together in a way that speaks family, that they are known and loved and cared for. Um, mm-hmm. And so I heard also God say to me, just start simply, but simply start. And I was like, okay. So one thing led to another. Um, so yeah. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And so have there been any things along the way that have kind of tried to discourage you from doing that or th- kind of excuses that have come up? This is Every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every day there's something, like with a large family. or mm-hmm. And for me, too, it's balancing the needs of our large family, like the capacity of our family, um, and always wanting to be able to provide an open door mm-hmm. for people to come and have a place at the table. Um, and... I think it's also um, discouragement, like Hannah was saying. Like, do does this really even matter? Like, mm-hmm. it's just food. You can go to Lola's and get a burrito. It's the same thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> but then I come back to, well, God just said, bring your two, just bring me what you have, mm-hmm. your five loaves of bread and your two fishes, and let me do the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I hold on to. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Sid. That's so cool. <laughs> There's something so powerful about just inviting people into your home. And I feel like it's kind of this bedrock of the most simple thing you can do is just to invite people into your home. We, um, I'm probably running out of time. Can you just stick up the next slide? Okay, so this young lady lives in Australia. Um, she, her name's Serena, and I just wanted to finish with the story about her. We, Nick and I, in 2008, we moved to a part of Australia called um, New South Wales, and that state was so big that it got divided into two in terms of regions for CS. And when we moved there in 2008, there were two leaders, so just by moving there, we doubled our Christian Surfers leadership. It was pretty awesome. I was the only woman at that point. And that, that stretch of coast is amazing. If you go to Australia, you should really go there. It's rocky headlands that go into beautiful white sandy beaches, rainforest that grows down to the beach, dolphins, birds. It's really a very beautiful part of the world. And many of you might have heard of a place called Byron Bay, which is in um, that section of New South Wales. It's a pretty iconic surf town. And it back in those days was known to be a bit of a graveyard for church planters and for Christian surfers missions. So when we um, were praying about starting a a mission there, there hadn't been a healthy Christian surfers there for a long time. So we're praying, and this girl, Serena, she would have been in her early 20s at the time, she was the one who put her hand up to lead a CS mission. And she was perfectly placed to start the mission. She was working in a a local school as a scripture teacher, so she had connecting with the kids. They knew she was a believer. She was able to talk to them about these things, and and then she gathered around her a group of great leaders, young leaders, um, and they they ended up being this fantastic mission there. And I was always so proud of her for putting up her hand, and I think there's two reasons that she was able to do that. And the first one was that she had role models, In Christian Surfers Australia at that time, we had Stephen Kath, Bailey leading the nation, and they were very clearly a couple in partnership. They led as a team. Kath was very visibly present in, um, you know, all the Christian Surfers Australia events. She had me as her regional coordinator. There were not, um, you know, in terms of women rising up through at that point, there were not a heap, but she she saw role models. And so that was the main thing. She had some role models, some women that she could could look to and see there is a path. I can do this. And so I just would say to you girls, when you feel like God's asking you to show up, don't forget that there's all these girls behind you who are watching you and who really need to see women on the platform, leading, serving Jesus. So that was the first thing. She had role models. And the second thing was that she had champions. She had men in her life through Christian surfers who were championing championing her to step into that role. Again, she had national leaders. She had other regional coordinators. She had Nick, my husband, who's a phenomenal empowerer and releaser. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy, male or female, he will empower and release. And so there were these two pieces that enabled her to step up 
and have this fantastic mission. And we used to always laugh at our regional camps because she would bring these Brahmis and they'd turn up and they'd put up their tents and then they'd have their Buddhist prayer flags and they'd drape their Buddhist prayer flags over their tents and they were, we had a whole bunch of vegans and it, you know, back in those days when we ran camps, it was all about the meat. There was lots of meat to be eaten but we'd have to have our vegan burger patties and sausages for these kids. You know, Byron Bay is like a, a really interesting place spiritually. The New Ages will tell you it's because um, the meridian lines converge there, the energy lines of the earth, so it's very significant. There's, it's a really cool place <laughs> that really needed surfers who love Jesus to be ministering there. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to finish with Serena. And I guess this picture to end, um, just to really petition you guys that together, as men and women, we represent the image of God. And that as we hear that call, um, that God is going to pour out his spirit on both men and women, that there is a place for both of us at the table. And um, together, we can do this. So I just, again, would just thank you to all the men here who've been willing to share your platform and been willing to open the door and give women a space. It's a really wonderful thing. And I would just petition you, do that for your wives, do that for your daughters, do that for your sisters in Christ. There are women in your mission who have gifts and talents who are just waiting for the opportunity to use them. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, yeah. Let me pray to finish. Well, Lord, you are good. You're so good to us. And we are in awe of the way that you work. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of Christian surfers. We thank you for the men and women that have met you through the ministry of Christian surfers. We thank you for the men and women that you have equipped and released. We thank you for the blessing to the body of Christ that this ministry is that it has been and is and will continue to be. Thank you for the many pastors ministering in their local communities who've risen up through the ranks of Christian surfers. We thank you for um, the promise that you are with us, that you empower us, that you will provide all that we need for, for, to fulfill your purposes on this earth. And we just celebrate with you, Lord, the fullness of your vision, that you're willing to come in and make us uncomfortable so that we can... Um, seek and save the lost. Yeah, we love you, Jesus, and we pray these things in your mighty, mighty and wonderful name. Amen.